It's our custom as we travel around Sabra and I to bring you greetings from the last three churches that we visited. And uh, those, we've asked them, and they have said, yes, please do that. And we mentioned you by name, your congregation, and uh, they were pretty much looking forward to the idea. I tell you, they may have completely forgotten about it. It was one, two, and three weeks ago at this point. But they handed those greetings to me. I put them in my pocket, and I'm taking them out nice and fresh for you right now. And those three churches that we visited, we've been traveling around like this since May of 2008. We're not going to go back that far, just the last three. Uh, and if I can find them here, are uh, Zion Lutheran in Victorville, uh, Prince of Peace in Hemet, and Ascension Lutheran in Apple Valley, California. And if you've got any grasp of Northern Cal, every, everywhere is Northern California from here, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty much, except for Mexicali. But, uh, if you've got any idea where those places are, you'll see why did they do it that way? Because the one before that was Moreno Valley. And that on the map, see, we make our plans like this on the map. We look at the map and we say, let's go here and then there, like that. And as it turns out, they end up like this, pretty much. So, uh, and, and that's just God at work. <laughs> that's all I can say, because that's, those are the times when people, we, we could go there. Uh, and it's his fuel, so that's fine. Uh, but they bring you their greetings. Now, if you like, uh, we can bring your greetings to the next three churches we visit and encourage them in your name to continue on and stead be steadfast and so forth. Okay. Yes? Okay, good. Uh, we'll do that. And those three would be Mission Lutheran in Las Cruces, New Mexico. We're taking next week off to go to Minnesota and visit short people who are grand to us. Uh, and... <laughs> We've got pictures, but not now. So uh, Mission Lutheran in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, possibly Zion in El Paso, and Ascension Lutheran in El Paso, Texas. So two weeks in El Paso. And we will uh, bring them your greetings, and they will be glad to hear it. You know they're out there, but now they've greeted you, and you can greet them, and it's, it's good. We'll be all together someday soon. So, uh, ah, disciples. I was talking to a young man once who said, Christianity is nothing but a multi-level marketing scheme. I said, go on. He said, all you people want to do is make more of you. Make more disciples. What's your job? Make disciples. Why? So we can make more disciples. You just, you just do that to pay the bills. And so, you know, and I, you can, the conversation went on from there. And I, it made me think. It's... It's good to listen to people because they make you think, and you can learn something from anyone, almost anyone. I haven't found anybody I can't learn something from. And I thought, you know, he's got kind of a point. He, he has that idea for a reason. But that's not the case. Jesus called disciples so that he could have more disciples, for sure. And he called his disciples to go and make disciples so they could have more disciples. And it's true that if you look through the text of some of the hymns in our hymn book and some of the songs uh, present in, in Christian music, and I do that for a living, uh, I do it quite often. That doesn't mean I'm authority. People can do things for a living and not be any good at it. Let me just say that. But, but I do it a lot, and I've noticed something, and it, uh, it is that oftentimes a hymn will extol what Jesus did and then say, oh, please let us hang on to that until we die so we can go to heaven. And Jesus called... None of those things are bad. But in between follow me and the last breath, there's a lot of living to be done. And Jesus seemed to be very interested in that and how it would go and what we would do while we are disciples. And so rather than this Sunday just being another instance of saying you, you should make disciples wherever you go, why? And what would we answer to that young man who said, Christianity is nothing but a pyramid scheme. So I'm going to sing you a song from Mark. That covers the same time period that we read about in Matthew this morning, but from a little different perspective. It covers one day in Capernaum. Matthew tells us that Jesus went to live in Capernaum. That's where his house was. He spent time, grew up in Nazareth, but when he Grew up and left the house, apparently he went to Capernaum. 
And according to Mark, this is the first thing that happened after he called these four disciples, the same four that we hear in Matthew, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Then he went down into Capernaum. So down into Capernaum, town in Galilee, to teach them in their synagogue with great authority. A thing they had not heard before in all their holy nation. Heaven's kingdom come to earth without equivocation. Now hell it will not suffer any light to pierce its dark. And yet it cannot stay or speak when told to disembark the father's son the servant king has all authority and when he exercises it the spirits must agree then he leaves for peter's house to share a Sabbath meal. Peter's mom-in-law is sick with something he might heal. He rebukes the fever, helps her up, in wonder they observe. The illness fled, she left her bed, and she began to serve. When the sun was setting and the Sabbath day was o'er, the whole city brought their sick and laid them at the door. And he did what he always does, he made the demons yield. He laid his hands upon the hill, by his word they were healed. has been given all authority in every place and he has handed it to those who simply seek his face for still the sick and those oppressed are lying at our door and he would bring his word to them that they be bound no more no more Oh, he would bring his word to them that they be bound no more. Mark uses the word authority. Matthew speaks of light. Mark doesn't tell us anything about what Jesus said, the content of his message, only that it was with great authority and people were marveling. In the synagogues of those days, one man would say this, another man would say that, and they would go head to head and they'd figure out uh, what it might be that the scripture or the law is saying in this particular point of fact. And Jesus came in and just walked through all of that, like a man in one of those long queues at the bank, or the, I watch a lot of British television, I just call it a queue. Uh, <laughs> the lines at the bank at, or at, at Disneyland or something, he just walked right through it all and all the lines just fell down. It's like that. They had set these things up because they didn't really know A said this, B said that. Jesus said, I say unto you this, as though he's God in the first person. He spoke with great authority in the synagogue. And immediately someone with a, a demon, possess, possessed with a demon, rose up and began to disrupt the proceedings. Hell won't suffer any light to come into its dark. And he simply said with the word, you, out! And it had to, it had to obey. Authority. They'd never seen anything like that. They had exorcism teams in the Jewish world too, like the Catholics have today. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But Jesus just said, out! Who has the authority to do that? Who is this guy? And from there he went 
After impressing them with his authoritative teaching, his authority over the evil spirit realm, the demons, he went to Peter's house at dinner after church, you know, and his mom was sick, his mom-in-law, mom and he went in and lifted her up, and immediately she was healed. And at the end of the day, because it's a Sabbath day and everything he did was working, he did it anyway. He's Lord of the Sabbath. He invented it and it exists for people. But they waited until sundown. And then they brought all their people because Sabbath is over. Jewish day ends at sundown and begins. Sabbath is over. Everybody had heard what he had done with great authority and they brought all their people to him to be healed and he healed them all. How long did that take? Through the night great authority. Matthew speaks of light, which is also quite authoritative. Sun, stop shining. Nope, the sun has authority to shine and it will continue to shine regardless of whether it's too hot or not. It will not stop. In the same way, God brought his light to the world and nothing would put it out. John tells us the same time frame. Light came. He's the light of the world. Darkness was not able to snuff it out or overcome it. Rather, the light overcame. And it's not a thing, and this is very significant for us this morning and every moment. He refused to do it without disciples. The first thing he did after his temptation in the desert, before that, his baptism, when the Lord said, you are my son, you are the king of Israel, that's what he's saying when he quotes Psalm 2, and you are, I'm well pleased with you, he quotes the beginning of Isaiah's servant songs, my king, my son, the servant king, come, go, go into the world, spread your light. He went through the devil's temptation, and the first thing he did was gather followers around him, people that could see what he was doing, people he could teach, Jesus doesn't work without followers, really. Wherever he goes, he calls people to follow him. They don't do much of the work. They're just standing around watching. He doesn't make them go run for coffee. They're not interns. They're his students. They have honor. He gives them dignity. He treats them with respect. Even when they're profoundly, enduringly, unimaginably stupid. When he tells them straight out, now that you know I'm the Christ, Here's what's going to happen. They're going to hand me over to the authorities. I'm going to be put to death. But on the third day, I will rise again. And Peter, who just shined a moment ago and got an A on his paper, said, you are the Christ. Takes him aside by the elbow and says, no, 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 this must never happen to you. Get away from me, Satan. Boy, how quickly things can change. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man, he said to Peter. But he kept him on as a disciple. This is a lesson, not expulsion. He never expelled any of his disciples, not even Judas. Judas walked away. But throughout their time with him, they failed continually. Teacher, we saw some people casting out demons in your name, in your name, but he's not one of us. Should we tell him to stop? Jesus. Didn't, he probably didn't do that. He was gentle and caring. He's a good teacher. He's very patient, very faithful. He said, nope, don't stop him. Let him go. Whoever's not against us, for us. On and on it went. After the incident I mentioned before, the, the Jesus, uh, Peter's confession, Jesus revealed himself twice more. And each time it resulted in the disciples saying, in one occasion, arguing amongst themselves about who the, who's the greatest. And another occasion, James and John's immediate response to Jesus laying out of his salvation plan was to say, teacher, can we sit at your right and left when you're ruling in your kingdom? They just didn't get it. And he still, he kept on. You might think at Pentecost, they finally understood. That's when the lights came on. Many lights were lit on Pentecost. And Peter, who was previously ready to run away, uh, such, such character, I will die with you. I don't know you. Boy, things change quickly. The Spirit certainly steadied him. He stood up and he preached a sermon, and 150 people were in the church at that point. And after his sermon, there were thousands. They came to him in droves. The Spirit did that in Peter. 
But it's not until Acts 10, lots of water over the dam, that Peter has a vision of foods he's not supposed to eat. He's still Jewish. After Pentecost, if you or I had been around there, they would have ignored us. They might have said, sure, you can listen, but stay over there. You're not one of us, unless you're Jewish. But if you're a Gentile like me, you're not welcome yet. They're still his disciples. Pentecost has occurred. The church is born. But there's still stuff they don't know. And undoubtedly, some of them think they know everything. Because you can't find a group of people where there's not somebody who doesn't know everything. And in church, it seems, I, I spend a lot of time in church, so it seems to happen more often there, but sometimes I'm that guy. God help me. That's when I fall on my face and I can't get up until the Spirit enters into me and stands me on my feet and I confess. But there were people who were astounded that Peter would go to the centurion, the Gentile Roman soldier who's oppressing us, his house, and the Spirit would fall on them. They were astounded. The Holy Spirit fell upon them and they prophesied and spoke in languages just like the Jews had. They were, they were astonished. They did not see that coming. How could they not see that coming? Light to the Gentiles. We don't know everything, but we're still his disciples. We sometimes act like we know everything or think we do. And even worse, sometimes we think that knowing everything will get us through the doors of heaven. It's Jesus that will get us through the doors of heaven and has opened them for us. But disciples are just that, students. How many masters has Jesus called? How many times does the Bible refer to all the Christian masters or lords? There aren't any. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one teacher. But you know, every time you find a passage you want to memorize or highlight in your Bible or a word of comfort, open the catechism, that's a good place too, those, those brief words of comfort because they're taken out of context, and put it back in its context. You will be hard-pressed. I haven't been able to find a place in the Bible where there's a word I really hang on to of saying of Jesus, a comforting message that isn't surrounded by crummy disciples acting stupidly. It's his response to them. I'm very thankful for that because I give him ample opportunity to teach me in that way. You might too, because you're laughing, and that means truth is in the room. <laughs> yeah. So when the thing they had trouble with was that they already knew that the Messiah would do what, the, what he would do when he came. They had his program all lined up for him. They knew he would put on a sharp sword and draw it and gather soldiers to himself, and they would go to our, our dig the swords out of the ground where we buried them and rise up and slay Gentiles and especially Romans. Could have been somebody else, could have, years ago it was the Greeks, might have been the Persians before that. They'd suffered a long time. They hadn't been free for years. They came back from exile, but they never got to rule themselves. And except for a brief time, and that really didn't last long or turn out very well. The Maccabees, and you can read about that. But here they are in Rome. When the Messiah comes, he will free us. He will break the rod of the oppressor. Little did they understand how he would do that. Who thinks ahead of time that somebody's going to fix everything by getting beaten up and killed? Every kid knows if you're the one getting beat up, you're not fixing things. But he pulled it off because his kingdom looks unlike any other kingdom. His kingdom has a king on his knees washing feet. A king who heals through the night or wherever there's someone to be healed. A king who can be put upon, who can be chased through the crowd whose robes can be grasped, a king who races to wherever there's danger, although subtly, usually without sirens. He's there already. He looks for trouble and goes to that. He's a first responder. He's a servant. Search the world to find a king like that. It's no wonder they didn't see him coming. It won't be until All Saints Day that you read the Beatitudes again in church. But I hope that today, after you've heard this bit of Mark or Matthew 4, you'll go and read 
the first words out of his mouth, where he speaks with authority, as Mark said, not in a synagogue, but in, on a mount, where all of his disciples gather to him. And he tells them, this thing I'm gathering you into, this thing that I'm calling my disciples to, here's what it looks like. Here's what you will look like if you follow me. Because in fact, what you will look like if you follow me is what I look like, Jesus is saying. The kingdom of God looks a lot like its king. And the way the people are in it reflect what he has done. Here is a song of the Beatitudes. Don't wait until November to read them because they follow right after the reading we had today. Go home this afternoon and, and read the Beatitudes and see what they say. It's the kingdom of God. Blessed is the poorest one who has no place to lay his head who puts himself in debt to all. Blessed is the one who mourns the loss of those he's led, breathing in the greatness of their fall. Blessed is the truest son of Abraham, the heir, who is meek and humble in his heart. Blessed is the one who ached to fill our void with righteousness, satisfied to play our part. Blessed be, blessed be the Lord, our righteousness. One who gave the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dead to live, that they might not be forsaken. Blessed is the one without impurities, who into his own father's house sinners has taken. Blessed is the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, who reconciled all things to him, that none would be lost. Blessed is the one who brought his gracious kingdom down to earth only to be crowned upon a cross. Blessed be, blessed be the Lord, our righteousness. And our blessing. Jesus brought together a group of people that would never have lived together without him. A zealot, a tax collector, it'd be at his. The zealots often had daggers up their sleeves. If they caught a tax collector in a crowded marketplace, they might stick it in him and consider the day a good one. Talk about red and blue. And yet they were all together. And he didn't seem to care about any of their beliefs. He was there to give them himself. He still operates that way. And I noticed party spirit was mentioned in the heading of the service today. Good thing, because that's what he dealt with through his, with his disciples all through the time. Everybody had great ideas about how things would go. And what they really needed to do was be quiet and listen and take stuff out so that he could put stuff in. Pray with me, will you? Lord Jesus, we need, we need to be relieved of many of our great ideas. There are so many people talking on our screens, through our speakers, face to face, who have heard the great plans, and mostly how ridiculous other people are, how we should hate them, how we should be angry. There's a lot of money in keeping us mad all the time, apparently, because so many people do it. Relieve us, we pray. Stop 
our ears to such things and open them to your word. You are not usually the loudest one in the room. Give us ears to listen to that still small voice. Put our noses in your word to hear what you have to say, to learn of your kingdom, to see how we might bend our knees to those around us and help them as you helped us all the time. Above all, Lord, be faithful to us. We are poor students. Keep teaching us. Keep leading us. Keep guiding us, we pray. And give us strength of your spirit that we might be more and more as you are. Thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.